Thanks. Um, I'd like to uh, frame this talk uh, by considering uh, two dominant theoretical positions in contemporary psychology. Um, cognitivists like Michael Tomasello suggest that we learn by reflecting on our mental representations and um, cognitivists are interested in thinking of the world in terms of information processing. Um, inactivists reject the role of representation in thinking. Um, they instead suggest that we learn by acting in and adapting to our environment. Instead of focusing on uh, information, uh, inactivists like Sean Gallagher um, are interested in affordances. Now, what's an affordance? Well, the concept of an affordance uh, can be traced back to um, figures like uh, Kurt Lewin and Kafka, uh, figures who Vygotsky was very familiar with. And this was a concept uh, that uh, he found very interesting, is Vygotsky's explanation of affordances. Objects in the environment are not neutral for us. As Lewin says, they not only create difficulties for us in our actions to a greater or lesser degree, or conversely facilitate actions, but many things and events that we meet manifest for us a more or less determined will. They stimulate us to certain actions, beautiful weather or a lovely landscape, move us to take a walk. The steps of a staircase simulate a two-year-old to climb and slide if the two-year-old is uh, tall enough. So this is why, uh, for example, if you look at the design of this axe handle, it has these grooves, which are affordances to make it easier um, to um, chop with the axe. It's also got some affordances for uh, unscrewing um, something uh, at the end there. So it would seem here like um, Vygotsky is on the side of inactivists. However, um, Vygotsky also says things which are um, quite conventional in terms of uh, the things that cognitivists think about. He uh, cites in full Marx's uh, famous uh, quote about the difference between an architect and a bee. So a bee is in a way always in its environment, adapting to its environment, uh, to its environment. Um, Whereas for an architect, well, for, for a human, at the end of every labor process, we get a result that already existed in an ideal form, that is, in the imagination of the laborer. So here it would seem like um, Vygotsky is a cognitivist. And there is a tension here. There's a tension between focusing on uh, affordances and focusing on mental representations, uh, at least as I've so far presented them. And Gallagher would take issue with um, Marx's explanation of the difference between architect and bees. Um, I think he would say that it uh, falls into the decoupling problem. The decoupling problem being that if you define representations as an image detached from what I am seeing here and now, from what I am sensing, then you are creating a dualism of um, images and thoughts on the one hand and worlds and bodies on the other. And if this image is detached, uh, how does it hook back onto the world? How do I um, match the representation to the world? Do I need uh, another representation to do that? And, and activists reject uh, this uh, decoupling and instead suggest that we can focus on uh, dynamical systems of feedback loops uh, that after the fact um, appear to us in certain ways. Uh, they um, appear to us phenomenologically um, as a result of uh, these um, yeah, effective volitional loops. So the problem though for inactivists with this picture is um, it means that we don't have a very good explanation of how our imagination does work. So if uh, decoupling 
images from bodies is the wrong thing to do, then how do we explain imagination? Gallagher draws on the philosopher, um, Gilbert Ryle, um, the philosophical behaviorist, um, as part of this explanation. So he says, when a child pretends to be a bear, he roars, he pads around the floor, he gnashes his teeth, and he pretends to sleep in what he pretends is a cave. Specifically, he does not do this by simulating these actions in his brain. He roars and moves and gestures and lies down on the floor. Imagination is in the action, in the playing and doing of it. There's something powerful about this account, but it also has some pretty obvious limitations. I can pretend to be a bear while imagining I'm a majestic unicorn. No external description of my behavior is going to correlate with the full capacities of my imagination. Okay, so what does Vygotsky think? Whose side is he on? In volume three of uh, the collected works, uh, Vygotsky says that ideal forms are something which is in the mind. And later in his lecture on the problem of the environment, he suggests that ideal forms are in the world and in direct reciprocal action. So it seems like we have on the left, Vygotsky the cognitivist and on the right, Vygotsky the activist. Now, I'm going to give you a bit of a spoiler. This is a false dichotomy and we'll see soon why. Vygotsky wants to take aspects of both of these um, contemporary frameworks that see each other as opposed. Here, uh, describing his favorite um, subject of the game of chess in his notebooks, um, he suggests that in order to play chess, you need to be responsive to the affordances of the chess pieces. And you also, in some ways, need to be able to break away from those affordances to create uh, chess moves uh, on the board. Um, so Gallagher would say this is uh, falling foul of the decoupling problem. I think this is exactly right. And I want to show why I don't think this is an inconsistency. I think this is a synthesis. So of course, any synthesis for Vygotsky here is going to involve signs and specifically is going to involve linguistic signs. In his notebooks, Vygotsky plays Bergson and Hegel off against each other to explore dimensions of linguistic signs and language use. I don't have time to explain Bergson's philosophy, so in Bergsonian fashion, I will instead provide an image. A cliff face embodies memories of the sea. As each wave hits the cliff, the cliff face is altered. It represents the sea, not in linear sequence, but in intensities. As each new wave rushes into the crevices of the cliff, the past and future exist as one in the form actualized in every collision, in every dance of rock and water. If some aspects of Bergson's idealism were inverted, Vygotsky thinks, one could appreciate his attempt to naturalize concepts and signs. He agrees with Bergson that words organizes a number of motor processes, but, criticize him, but, but criticizes him for limiting his account to this kind of habituation. For Vygotsky, Bergson cannot distinguish between the effect of a word on thinking and the effect of, say, hydrochloric acid on limestone. Bergson does not appreciate the Hegelian dimensions of words as interpersonal cultural historical functions. To illustrate this Hegelian criticism, Vygotsky uses a psychoanalytic example. A traumatic event can alter one's mind at the level of the unconscious and motor habits in ways that can perhaps account for the repetition of the trauma in neurosis. But for me to experience this as an image of that traumatic event 
Vygotsky suggests we need language in its discursive form. Vygotsky also thinks that Bergson is wrong to assume that we intuit multiplicities to begin with, multiplicities of particulars, and then generalize from them. For Vygotsky, we need to generalize before we can grasp particulars. The contradiction here is not a logical contradiction. It is not an inconsistency. It's a synthetic contradiction. It is a contradiction between sociogenesis, the cultural historical dimension, and natural history. Vygotsky wants to see words as both natural objects in the world, embedded in habits and causes, and as part of discursive practices. Words as natural objects reify effective volitional relations to things in the world, but as discursive functions, they allow us to find meaning and give justifications. Philosopher Wilfred Sellers calls this the Janus face character of languagings as belonging to both the causal order and the order of reasons. For Vygotsky, while, de while developmentally earlier functions can be characterized in terms of loops of perception and volition, the development of understanding depends on the capacity to be oriented in the complex internal space that might be called a system of sign relations, or to use sellers, a space of reasons. Okay. Representations cannot transmit meaning to us prior to learning and outside of specific practices. That a picture of a doll represents her doll is something that Vygotsky suggests the child must learn. It is not given by the picture itself. Nelson Goodman gives another example. When ethnographers show people living in a culture with no experience of photography, a photograph of their own house or village, they could not recognize them in the photo. Representations appear first between people. Vygotsky actually has a multiple, uh, a multi-stage explanation of um, a process of how representations develop. But the key here, the key message is that we should think about representations and affordances as a unity as part of a de de developmental process. So he has a, de a developmental story um, to tell about representing as activities. He draws on, and Scatterer here, I won't um, go into that, but I am using the uh, widely known uh, division uh, popularized by Peirce of icon index symbol. When a child is developing their ability to use signs, what is important is not a correlation between a signifier in the head and signified in the world, but the expression of a move in the broader game or activity. A child wanted to draw, um, a child wanted to show in the drawing how it gets dark when the curtains are closed, and he made a forceful line down the board as if he was drawing a window shade. The drawing movement did not signify a curtain cord, but expressed specifically the movement of drawing uh, a curtain. Vygotsky suggests that actions like mining of drawing cur a curtain can be thought of as analogous to, but developmentally earlier than, full-fledged language use. The activity Vygotsky is describing here is iconic, i.e. it bears some spatio-temporal isomorphy with what it is meant to represent. Growling like a bear and holding my hands like this are also iconic gestures. Okay, index is something that points to or is tied to what it represents. Uh, a clock face can represent a pharmacy for a child, not because it looks like a pharmacy, but because it is able to embody the child's intentions in pretend play, for instance. She can walk the doll from the fire station to the pharmacy. When the clock represents the pharmacy, one child points to the face and says, here is the medicine and the pharmacy. And another points to the ring and says, this is the entry. It's the door to the pharmacy. Only the gesture that refers to them imparts this sense to them, indicates this sense. Um, there's nothing else the child means by tying the clock, the, the clock face to the medicine. There are no additional consequences. 
She might, for, for example, know um, that aspirin treats headaches, but if her friend says he has a headache in the role play, she would not yet be able to point to the clock face in offering a treatment. Indexical sign relations are an important part of our imagination. If I now feel the air on my face, I can imagine it flowing through my lush unicorn mane. So we go from here to um, symbolic activity. And when we look at a symbol, in a symbol, um, not one molecule uh, depends on the thing that it uh, represents. Uh, symbols depend on social recognition, um, not on physical affordances. And here's why this is a developmental picture where we move from one of the paradigms I mentioned earlier to the other. So here, um, a course of action or a game can transfer to new situations. In the new game, the child can grab the clock to mean pharmacy if her friend says she's ill. This allows a lot in the activity to be taken as given. Um, so the, ch the child can shout, the cowboy is getting away without having to tell her friends that the stick is a horse and the boy is riding the horse away from them, etc. cetera. Vygotsky calls this process internalization. This is how I can voluntarily imagine I'm a unicorn while I'm sitting here, though I am not in fact a unicorn. Objects reify courses of actions and affects. Enculturation allows a child to orient herself in her environment using lower grade signs before she has full grasp of concepts that supervene on these signs. The effective volitional plane described by Bergson and Lewin is something we share with other animals, but behavior on this plane is limited to iconic and, inde and indexical sign activity. For instance, there's nothing else a vervet monkey means by its call when it sees a leopard. The call is an affordance that other vervet monkeys uh, respond to to get away from the leopard. Humans, meanwhile, are at home in the semantic symbolic plane. Symbolic activity depends on and is a species of effective volitional activity, but symbolic activity has no outer boundary. Thus, the higher functions permeate the lower and reform all of them. The selection of icons and indices in symbolic activity is what we call imagination. Thank you.